Task Force South, the battle for the Falklands. Tonight's programme shows the attack by Argentine planes on the troop ship Sir Galahad at Bluff Cove. It contains scenes which some viewers may find distressing. In the course of its duties, within the total exclusion zone, around the Falkland Islands, bring to resurrection with all the saints the bodies of these our brothers. In the first week of June, the advance on Stanley was moving with near textbook precision. The large numbers of prisoners taken at Goose Green were a drain on the limited British resources, but it made for a lot of men who would not have to be fought again. Prisoners, still without their bootlaces, were marched back to a temporary prison compound improvised at San Carlos Bay. They were warned that although it was their duty to escape, they'd be shot if they attempted to. Otherwise, they'd be treated as well as possible. had little shelter, just a few tents between them, but only a few days to wait, watching the British build up before they were sent home. 250 of their countrymen would not be returning from the battlefield at Goose Green. Bring to resurrection with all the saints the bodies of these our brothers, which in their frailty we now bury. May God unite their souls with those of all the saints and faithful departed. The bleak burial service around a waterlogged grave was attended only by the three senior Argentine officers and the British brigadier Tony Wilson, who had now been put in charge of the southern flank. Catholic chaplain's words were repeated in Spanish by an Argentine priest captured with the garrison at Goose Green.
The 5th Infantry Brigade, the Gurkhas, the Welsh and the Scots Guards, sent out in the QE2, had now reached the island and were disembarking. The Gurkhas, anxious for honour and medals, were eager to be moving forward. With their cookeries, the curved knives from Nepal, source of many myths, they were greatly feared by the Argentine defenders. Hmm. What else? What else? Uh, on the nose. And your left cheek. Cheek better rugby ball. Correction. <laughs> they took over the defence of Goose Green and under the command of their Gurkali speaking officers mounted airborne patrols to round up any Argentine stragglers who'd fled after the battle. Down the centre, as you said, and we'll go over Sea Line. We'll see Line, and then we'll stop and look at, at um, Envy Point. Yep. We'll then go to Envy Point, we'll look at the hill, and we'll go to the hill, the hill will look at Lively Settlement. By this time, you should be catching me up. Um, and if Lively Settlement's clear, we'll all go to Lively Settlement, we'll drop off the infantry. We will then come down with, an with just the aircraft board, and we will check the east coast of Argentina. Thanks, Matt. Can you make a further suggestion? Don't go respectfully. Why don't you listen to me, Jacks? Um, the Army helicopter pilots, Teeny Weeny Airways as they were known, were briefed on where the Argentine troops had been seen. Mostly they found only abandoned arms and empty tents fluttering in the wind. But these tiny helicopters were central to one of the most daring advances of the whole campaign, the capture of Bluff Cove, just a dozen miles from the outskirts of Stanley. Brigadier Wilson explained how he'd seized the opportunity to leap forward. Five Brigade, once they got ashore, went into San Carlos, as indeed most people have when they've landed in the Falkland Islands. And as you well know, I had two para forward at that time, who, under command of three commando brigade, had taken Darwin and Goose Green. What I wanted to do was to get a battalion forward to relieve two para at the earliest opportunity, and I fed the first seventh Gurkha rifles forward then. As soon as the first seventh were in Darwin, Goose Green, and building up on the ground, it gave me a battalion in my hand, which I could use and do something else with. And I've long had my eye on moving as far forward as I could get so that I could get myself poised for whatever comes in what you might call the final phase. And certainly, Fitzroy and Bluff Cove were two places that we particularly wanted. Talking to all the locals around Darwin and Goose Green, we had heard that in a house here, Swan Inlet House, there was a telephone, and that for some extraordinary reason, the line was still intact between Swan Inlet House and Fitzroy or Bluff Cove, and that if we could possibly get to that house, we might well be able to discover whether there were any enemy in Fitzroy or Bluff. So I thought it's worth a try. What we've got to do is to get somebody up to that house and see if that's true. So we formed up a special heliborne force here using two armed helicopters. That's two scout helicopters with SS-11 to fly flank protection, and then three scout helicopters containing soldiers to fly in a Vic formation between them. And I told two para that I wanted them to fly up low and get into Swan Inlet House, as it were, seize the house. It puts it dramatically, but you know what I mean. And having got there, it sounds anticlimactic, make a telephone call. And this was Wednesday afternoon, about the middle of Wednesday afternoon. At that time, the clouds were starting to roll down on the mountains to the north, and that's a good advantage, because there's an OP up on Mount Osborne, and we suspected there was another enemy OP on Blue Mountain, and we didn't know what was further forward, and I certainly didn't want interference from any of them. Well, the Heliborn force went off, got to Swan Inlet House, 
and incredibly found a telephone, picked up the telephone, dialed Fitzroy, as it were, and Bluff Cove, got through, and somebody answered. Well, they just said it was the British Army. And had the phone been ringing very much before then? Not really. So you're a bit surprised to have it ring at all? Well, I didn't expect to hear them on it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say anything to them? <laughs> no, well, they asked me if the Argentines were in, I said no, and then I went and got that. I was standing in the kitchen, and when Michelle burst straight through the, the door and said, the British are on the phone, you know? And I still couldn't really believe it. No one sort of thought she was joking, so I came in and uh, answered, and they said, yes, the British Army. And uh, I said, well, that's great, Neil. Where are you? Of course, they wouldn't tell me. They said, we're still in the Darwin area. But uh, I knew they were fairly close because they were quite late on the phone. Mm -hmm. So what did they ask you? They asked, uh, was there any Argentines in the area? And uh, I told them that they'd pulled out the day before after they blew the Fitzroy Bridge. And um, they asked, was there any Bluff Cove? And I said, well, there wasn't. They all pulled back past there. And they said, fine, we'll, we'll be seeing you later. So again, we formed up a heliborne force. And this time, we had the two armed helicopters once again flying flank protection. We had a single scout flying as Pathfinder ahead of the group, followed by two scouts, which had then LS parties, in other words, armed soldiers, ready to leap out and fan out on the ground and secure the landing sites for any other helicopters to come in. And five minutes behind, that is in time, we had our one faithful Chinook, which magically at that moment had fallen into my hands. It had arrived for some other task and we grabbed it. And we shoved as many sh soldiers as we could into that Chinook, more, I dare say, than the makers ever intended as helicopters should carry. We had two sections of 81 millimeter mortars. We had Milan missiles. Every single soldier carried four mortar bombs. And we kept cramming them in. And when they didn't fit any longer, we literally <coughs> booted them into the, into the helicopter and got them in. And so this force took off and flew low up there. And we waited then very anxiously indeed for the code words to come back that they'd grabbed the place. And it's a distance of 55 kilometers, which is really quite some leap. They put down, and they got it, Fitzroy, and then they put down, and they got Bluff Cove. The importance of the small settlements at Fitzroy and Bluff Cove lay in the bridge that linked them. The last bottleneck on the road to Stanley, it was now firmly in British hands. The urgent need was to get more troops up to them. Helicopters were in short supply, desperately so after Atlantic Conveyor was sunk. The lack of them was slowing the whole advance. The Gurkhas started off walking, but there wasn't time for the whole brigade to march to the front, even if they could. Every possible means of transport was pressed into service. The flag of the 5th Infantry was hoisted over the Monsoonan, an old island trader which was used as a big landing craft. With a company of Gurkhas and as many stores as could fit into the hold, she set off for the six-hour voyage along the coast to Bluff Cove. One of the islanders, Finlay Ferguson volunteered as skipper with the local crew. Along the way, she passed the Ilas Malvinas, an Argentine patrol boat which had been shot up by the Sea Harriers during the blockade. But now the air threat was against us. It was our turn to be worried about air attack. Gurkhas are tremendous realists. They just accept things for what they are. They know why they're here. Uh, they know what it's all about, and they'll just accept the country for what it is and just get on with surviving in it and living in it. They've been digging their own holes to go into? Yes, we've been... We walked all the way from San Carlos down to Goose Green, which took several days, and each day, each night, we were setting up in a new position, digging a new set of shell scrapes, uh, sangers, and preparing ourselves for defence of ourselves. So they're getting used to the, uh, the routine, basically. So uh, a lift on, on the way is very welcome. Oh, magic. <laughs> Fabulous not to have to walk. Please, 
Ahead of us, the brigade headquarters was being set up in a barn. The maps were being marked with the dispositions of the enemy. The final plans for moving the last dozen miles to Port Stanley were being laid. The end could not be far off. The desperate need was to get men up to the front. They were being brought round by sea and slipped ashore at night. But for their equipment, ships would need to come in and anchor. The engineers were already repairing the bridge between Fitzroy and Bluff Cove. The Argentinians had blown up one end. It would have to be repaired before vehicles could move across it. But the retreating troops had only had time to destroy one pair of supports and the work was well advanced. Even the mines left in the rubble hadn't slowed things up. The brigade was sufficiently established to abandon the attempt to keeping its position secret. The Blues and Royals with their armoured vehicles patrolled forward, probing the strength of the enemy defences. Two support ships had arrived and started by unloading anti-aircraft defences. But luck went against them. The mountain mists which had obscured the Argentine observation posts cleared that day. And the Argentine Air Force, dormant for nearly 10 days, struck a final blow. Lacking adequate radar, the first warning came as the plane swept low over the ships, Sir Tristram and Sir Galahad. The anti-aircraft missiles were not yet effective. Both ships were hit, Sir Galahad was immediately in flames. Two companies of the Welsh Guard were still on board. The helicopters abandoned their tasks, queued up to join the perilous rescue. horrifying moment of the whole war, made worse by our helplessness.
there was nothing that we could do except wait with the medical teams on the cliff tops. Some of the life rafts started to drift back towards the ship. The helicopter pilots used their rotors to blow the lightweight craft to safety. Every boat and landing craft went out to help. The unanswered question was why hadn't they been used five hours earlier to get the men off as soon as they'd arrived. Apart from the 400 soldiers, each ship had a crew of 68, many of them Chinese.